Hey folks, welcome to another great interview of The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This time around I talked to Jason, Jason Shevtel about China and some of the misunderstandings that people seem to have about the country and its history. Uh, Jason comes at this from a, an interesting perspective, uh, but not one that is specifically leftist. So this interview may not fit what some people want to hear, but I think that it's really informative and uh, it's really interesting. And I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about China beforehand. <clears throat> I racked my brain all, all morning yesterday and all, oh, all day yesterday and all morning today, trying to come up with a good intro topic to just kind of talk about before the interview and I didn't come up with anything. So the only thing left to say is like, uh, I hope you enjoy the interview. Uh, the day I'm recording this Marjorie Taylor green, uh, the Republican representative from Georgia's 14th district, uh, was banned on Twitter for spreading misinformation. So yay, that's good. <laughs> Besides that, I hope everyone has, uh, is having a good start to the new year. And I hope that you all have a successful year doing whatever it is that you want to achieve. Uh, with that on to the interview. <laughs> All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Jason, and I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sheftel. Sheftel. Okay. Uh, I So you are on, sent me an email to talk about uh, China because you've done a lot of research and you have done... Uh, you've had a podcast that you did regarding the subject of China and what's going on. And I, I want to, I, I guess, first get a bit of a background on you and uh, where you, what kind of angle you're coming at uh, the, your examination of China through. Sure. Sounds good. So my interest in sort of fascination with China goes back to when I was really young and I really got interested actually during, let's say, to September 11th, 2001, and then the Iraq war, where the United States was suddenly getting into these crazy Middle Eastern misadventures all around the world. I could tell early, everyone could tell early on this was not going to end well, was not smart. And then in the background, you had a really large, powerful, old, ancient, uh, sophisticated sort of country that was coming together, coming online really into the modern world. And I was just very fascinated by that. So I was always interested. So I was reading ancient Chinese you know, classic novels when I was a kid. Uh, and all that. And then I went to college and I actually got a scholarship. I studied in China, studied Chinese, studied in Beijing at their university, traveled around China, stayed there, et cetera. Cool. And then that was big. And, you know, for me also, my perspective, you know, my, my grandfather was actually a developmental economist who worked in India and China. So okay. that goes back. And then what happened to me is the global financial crisis really impacted kind of me. Like I was always very into economics, very into politics, all that kind of stuff. But I found things were so um, misrepresented Let's you know, in, in you know, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, places like that, that I was I was very disabused of what I thought was really going on. So what I said is basically, you know what, I'm going to put all this aside and, you know, try and find my own framework for how to look at things. And then I'm going to come back and like approach these various publications, theories with my own system in place. And so the okay. perspective that I took, in addition to the sort of China studies, is my perspective is very, very geographic. So this is built from the ground up. This is built, so in China's cases, this means going back to when China formed, where it formed, the rivers, the various populations, how the people came together, why the population is, is the size it is, the structure it is, sort of how the ethnic composition came together over time, how the religious factors came in. It really is sort of a, a ground up uh, perspective of things. And that actually does apply to various things from how capital interest rates and all these things manifest, labor relations, all that kind of stuff. But it was very much a, a ground up phenomenon. And that, yeah, and then so now, I also, I also have a, a legal background and so okay. a lot of what I did also there is also, it, it was land use, it was development, it was the same process of how do you get something that is that has nothing, that has no development, that is totally impoverished, and what takes it to, you know, middle income, high income, not or, or just out of poverty, <laughs> out of like absolute brutal crushing poverty. And right. yeah, and so those are sort of the perspectives that I bring. And then, yeah, so what I did is I, I've, early on in the pandemic, right before the pandemic hit, I finished, you know, the first attempt at the, at the book I've been doing, which is called China Unraveled, which is the name of the podcast, which goes through all of Chinese history and sort of says how it became what it is, how it got to where it is in the modern world, and then what's going to happen next. And that is where the, the rubber sort of hits the road, really meets the road. And it's going to really just China's become the, the big 
comparison for the United States, for other countries. Right. So this is the thing. And so it's in the end, the really Im- important, impactful thing is going to be how does what we learn about China impact what we do in Canada or the United States or other Western countries? So that's kind of my whole story. That's interesting. So uh, I know uh, like I'm a, I'm a left uh, wing person. I know a lot of people online right now, they're very, there's a lot of discourse about China uh, and how it seems like America is almost on a, a cold war uh, or ramping up like a cold war type of rhetoric with China. So uh, like, I wonder how much of what we see in our current media structure, can we actually believe regarding China? Well, there's a lot of takes you could, you could have on that. One thing is that China is recently, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, it kind of removed a lot of foreign journalists and it's been making mm-hmm. things extremely difficult for people who try and just get their information that way. And it's such a large country that even if you like, you know, even for me, you live in Beijing for a while, that, that that's like living in Washington DC and saying you understand the United States, right? <laughs> it doesn't, it's not enough. So it's right. very difficult. Um, and there's many, you need many different takes. So you need people who are Chinese language specialists. You need people who are economic specialists. You need people who have a sense of the culture, who have a sense of the strategic sort of um, vision of the Communist Party, who have a sense of actually what the Communist Party, how it actually operates. Because the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's not quite what it sounds like. So it's just, right. it's very complex. It's extremely, extremely complex. And if you're just trying to take it in through short little <laughs> articles, it, right. it's going to be very difficult to build a comprehensive understanding of it. And that's just... And everything we're doing in the media is towards headlines and towards really small, little, you know, bite-sized chunks, which probably is never going to give you the full meal. Yeah. And and a lot of people don't even read the articles. They just read the headlines or whatever that yeah. says. <laughs> so, so I wonder, like, so given how complex the current status of uh, China is and the depth of history they have how big is your book <laughs> yeah it's pretty big I mean, that's, that's a major problem i mean so the 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 main challenge with a book like this is to make it is to simplify it, it it's you know you're running compression algorithms on all this stuff and <laughs> right. you're trying to have them be as lossless as possible you don't want to you really don't want to just make it too complicated and so you're looking for meta narratives you're looking for um long l- patterns that you know cover hundreds of years or if, even a millennia and then you're trying to really find the large aggregate. So economic theory is very useful when you talk about things like land and labor and capital, and you just want to use those to understand. And obviously in the modern world, you have savings, you have investment, you have consumption, you have demand, right. you have all this kind of stuff. But these basic things can really help to make sense of this stuff. Um, and you also have to learn what to cut. So a lot of Chinese art, uh, you know, one thing in the West, for example, a lot of art returns back to Greece. I mean, to, to Egypt, but also through Greece, particularly that fifth century, you know, Greece. And you can trace a lot of Christian art, a lot of the forms, the gestures, the the facial expressions, the, all this stuff. It, it all comes back to there. But in China, it's very different. You go watch these okay. like, the the basic just to explain these differences can be very difficult. So there's some areas you just got to know, like, hey, you don't need to look at jade pottery right now. You don't need to look at a chariot. You know, there's there's a lot of things. Um, that are tough. And also a lot of it is also just smashing myths. That's a lot of what you have to do because right. there's a lot of really bad preconceived notions about what China is and what it's going to become. And and it's just, just smashing those gives you a lot of leeway because people have <laughs> nothing left. So you're just like, I'll just, you know, a lot of it's just re, just telling a better story also. Right, right. What more accessible, more uh, comprehensible, makes more sense. It uh, vibes with what you see in the world and what you see going on. And ultimately it's the explanatory power of whatever I'm saying to actually make sense of the world around you and make sense of what's going on in China. And yeah, that's really helpful because it's <laughs> not easy. <laughs> well, what are some of the biggest, like some of the most uh, mainstream myths that you've had to, you have to debunk? Yeah. I mean, the main one, I mean, not the main one, like a really big one is just this idea that China has been a unified, uh, powerful centralized state for thousands of years, right? That's okay. what you're, you're like, you're like, here's this, you got dynasty, 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 just one successive linear continuous dynasty. After, you know, you have like quick dynasty and then like a little, <laughs> little period of like problems and you get a new dynasty and it's just on and on and on. That's totally wrong. I mean, what you okay. really have is you have a brief period, like one third of any of the dynasties that you can read about. One third of that period is actually like actual unified integrate rule. The rest is trying to conquer everything or the place collapsing. And there's just massive periods of total chaos in Chinese history. Wow. As an, as an example, before China really came together, 221 BC is the, the best era. That's the Qin dynasty, which is most likely where the word China comes from, at least in the okay. West, Qin, China. 
before then, before then, there was literally five over five hundred years of continuous nonstop violence in the country. Wow, that is more than you know twice the the, the, the history of the United <laughs> States. Right, that would go back yeah. to like before the scientific revolution. If you just did this, it's insane, and you have to explain why. Like, why did this happen? Like, why does it keep recurring? Why does China keep breaking into pieces and fighting and warring with itself? Um, so, and that's where this this geography, this geographic perspective, is really powerful because. Most cities in China have had dozens of names. They've had dozens of rulers. They've been parts of dozens of states. And you have to see how the regions and the pieces fit together. You know, that's th really important. Similar to how in the United States, you might say, here's California, here's Texas. And, but you don't even need to know the states. You need to like, what is the internal regions? Okay, here's this, you know, the Central Valley of California. Right. What different groups have, have taken, you know what I mean? This is how you really like have to Like mountainous do it. regions, places that are strategically yeah. beneficial, have good agricultural All that stuff. kind of stuff. It is so important, man. It is so, like, it's, it's funny because we, 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 we minimize it. But, like, for example, like a place like Canada, you know, Canada is 100 times the size of South Korea, yet it has, South Korea has 25% more people right? What on earth is that? Like, these are these <laughs> yeah. things where, these are these things where it's like, you know, some of these basics, if you understand them pretty well, it can help you build a, a like a solid foundation for getting this stuff. And with China, it's just totally essential. Like if you don't understand like the North China plane, or you don't understand uh, how the Yangtze region operates, like it's just not possible to understand the country. Like it's just, it's too much history. You'll just drown in it. You will just right. drown in the history. <laughs> and, that's, that's, and also China's obsessed with this history. There's probably no country on earth that is more obsessed with its own history than China. And ironically, it's all that also makes it one of the worst, you know, the most biased countries in the world. You know, it's like <laughs> when, you're, when you're so in love with your own idea, like you're often a little off on when you kind of try to give a read on yourself. So right. You can't stuck. critically examine your own stuff. <laughs> yeah. So then you're stuck. You're like, well, they, they, they'll, they'll give you oodles of history, but you can't trust it. Right. So it's just, so that's a big one. I would say this, this question of how much of China's history is a ordered state Versus, you know, chaotic, disunified, you know, motley right. operation. Uh, that's a really big one because then in the modern world right now, the question is, okay, is this the most recent incarnation of a super powerful integrated Chinese megastate that's going to last for hundreds of years? Or is this yet another very brief integrated phase that is, you know, bookended typically by massive periods of violence and chaos and disunity? Right. Well, that's, I mean, a pretty good question. <laughs> A good question, right? And it's a it's it's a very good question, but yeah. So that's that's a that's a really big one. Uh, then also, I think you know one of the most challenging things to understand is just like left, you know, left right in the, in the in sort of the in the West, the sort of there's a political division basically came with the the French Revolution. It doesn't actually right. go much farther back than that. It means almost nothing in China. It, it doesn't mean anything at all. And also, the idea of a democracy means nothing in China. In a, in a republic, there is no history. There's no golden era of Rome or Greece. None of this exists. Right. Do you know what I mean? So the idea of what, it, what does a people's republic mean? Like we, we're assuming things that aren't, that aren't there. And we're even assuming <laughs> divisions that aren't there. Um, yeah, almost based on like our own ideas of what these things mean, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, you go to China right now. If you go to China, um, most a lot of people in China think that you know, they're basically a democracy. They think democracy just means a government that rules in the public interest. It's like, okay, okay. well, sure. that's, that's a cool idea, except that's just not what anybody we think here. So if all these people are saying they're de it's a democracy, it's like, all right, well, what are we even talking about, right? So yeah. th this just means that our ability to communicate, if we want to assume these terms mean all that much, it's just going to lead you into a muddle. You're just not right. going to get anywhere. Um, and also the Communist Party has oodles of pop propaganda. Like it has some of the most intricate, dense, multi-layered levels of propaganda that any state has ever developed. And so right. it's like, okay. Not only is the history kind of compromised, but the even the entire modern political conversation is also pretty compromised. Doesn't want to admit many things. So you're just again like you need you need other systems. Otherwise, the, the words and the actions are just going to just right. You, know, it, make it you almost yeah, like you can't uh, you can't necessarily trust any of the sources that you're seeing uh, from you know various mainstream places. Even like I guess it's hard to uh, I uh, just to. Uh, shoot from the what's been going on in my brain about China lately is like this issue with the Uyghurs, right? Sure. It's hard for me to know what to think because I hear, you know, uh, something from a particular source that source has, uh, this kind of background and this kind of agenda. And then I hear another one from another source that, de that supposedly debunks that. But then I hear that that debunking has this source and this agenda 
that is trying to push a propagandist view as well. And it's, so it's really hard to know even what to think because there's so much, I guess, obfuscation is the best way I could frame it. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things we all need to get better at is reading the, you know, the sort of the agenda behind all these different publications, but also the the broader structuring you know, perspective for something like how does uh, the Chinese central government treat uh, dis, you know, potentially disruptive or divisive minorities along its periphery? Well, that's actually a very, very old question, right? That right. is, this goes back thousands of years. And you know, there's a long history to this. Uh, you know, one thing people don't actually know is that back in the seven, you know, the 18th century, this is when the Qing dynasty was expanding into the current region where you have the Uyghurs. Uh, okay. The Uyghurs actually collaborated with the old Qing dynasty to uh, participate in a genocide of another people that no longer exists called the Dzungars. Okay. Um, so that's something we don't hear. And actually what we're seeing now is a lot of the Basically, one way to think about it is the Chinese government is trying to, I won't say finish the job in the sense of a genocide, but finish the job in the sense of pacifying this uh, restive Western region, which has many minerals, but is also a, a funnel for a lot of uh, Islamic, further Islamic extremist elements down like a pretty old uh, path okay. into, into China. But the way to think about it is, yeah, I mean, the, the Uyghur situation is very much, there's, you know, capacity for over a mil- to put over a million people into camps. There is the most systemic, systematic, and um, pretty horrifying levels of surveillance and monitoring going on. So that means they have biometric markers, they have blood markers, they have gait analysis, they have uh, AI systems that can track your emotions when you're walking by streets. So if you walk by a building and it looks like you're angry, you might get stopped. They have comprehensive monitoring of, of like a number of things. And this has actually been the place where the Chinese government is was testing a lot of systems and uh methods that it's going to be applying, it's applying large scale across China because it needs to begin to much more seriously monitor and control its population as economic growth and social tension, economic growth declines and social tensions uh, rise. And the population in, you know, in Western China, the Uyghurs, uh, they were, you know, this really started sort of around the financial crisis, tried to get more protests, bombing, stuff like that. And yeah, they've been ramping up, but it's at this point, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty horrifying over there, man. And the, you don't need a, you don't, there's not like a, oh, they're not really doing much anything. It's like, no, like this is the same thing with Hong <laughs> Kong. Uh, you know, th- there's many right. areas. And in general, people need to realize the Chinese state, again, is not a hyper powerful, confident state. It, it's very uncomfortable and fragile. And it's always looking for ways to uh, secure its position. So China has more land borders than any other country. And over half of the people, uh, neighbors claim some part of its territory. Okay. And it has to have a military stationed all across the country to prepare for wars in, in every single direction. So this is a, you know, this is an embattled state in many ways. And it doesn't seem like that. But again, you don't have a two million person military if that wasn't you know, the case. And right. also people need to realize that China spends more on internal security than on external defense. So that means it pays more to prepare for rebellions in, within its own territory than it prepares to fight the United States or to conquer Taiwan. So this is, again, this is this question of how do the different pieces of China actually come together as one powerful state or how much are they being, you know, like clenched together by a a briefly (laughs) powerful state and it's just trying to prevent the ball from spinning out of uh, control. Yeah, I was reading actually, uh, you have an article on your website about uh, feeding China where you talk about how like, uh, it seems like at any moment they could lose their food production basically. And how it's how precarious their situation is right now. Just yeah, just think about it. One, you know, they, so China's actually been lying about its population. So it's probably a hundred million people less than it says for various reasons. But okay, doesn't matter. Still a lot of people, <laughs> over a billion <laughs> yeah. people. Yeah, how do you, that's a lot of people to feed. You know, again, right. this is one thing where in the modern world we we want, we all have to talk about um, conservative this, liberal that, left this, right that. That's fine. But how does basic agriculture in a country work? How does the actual energy system in a country work? How does the medical system work? Like you have to know basic subsystems of how a country works. If you want to have any idea about, you know, what its potential political economy can even look like. Like, right. you know, it, like right now, for example, Lebanon is decivilizing. It is disappearing as a country. For people who don't know, they don't have energy. They don't have food. All the doctors, lawyers, professionals, engineers in the country are fleeing. There hasn't yeah. been a real functional government in over 15 months. There's, you know, sectarian violence spewing all across the country. 
you know, the question of who's left or like this doesn't even matter. And for China, <laughs> right. historically, one of the biggest problems is who will feed China, right? Who will feed China? It is a massive problem. And when before the the Chinese uh, sort of got back in bed with the United States, you know, in the 1970s, the they were they were trend. I mean, they had the worst famine in human history. And if they right. maintained their policies, let's say they'd kept, you know, they'd kept the they hadn't done a one child policy yet. Because the reason we have the one child policy again is this is a it's Massive a development famine. question. <laughs> yeah, we're looking if it, it, yeah if they hadn't done a one child policy, if they had tried to keep their insane sort of uh, backyard industrialization policies, if they'd kept their collectivized agriculture policies, they done all these things, and they hadn't gotten stuff new technologies in the United States, they would have seen a rolling series of the absolute worst famines in human history. Like this is the sort of thing that would make Thomas Malthus like curl into the fetal position. Like we're talking brutal. Again, we assume China has all these. Back then, it had nothing. It had no systems. It had no ra- right, trains, right. railroads, anything. This is horrifying. So that is le- and that, and remember the the Xi Jinping, for example. They remember famine. You know, they they <laughs> right. you know like people remember. This is not like like for example, the United States has never the continent. Of the United States has never experienced a famine in its entire history, right? I might say that in that article where we we need to understand that these countries are extremely different, like right. totally different. And basically what I'm saying is that, you know, the United States is calorie uh, rich yeah. and China historically is calorie poor. And that matters a lot. And so right now, China has a lot of uh, energy problems. You know, there's, there's power outages in 75% of China for a bunch of reasons. But we got to remember that all these systems feed on each other. So a big, the only reason that China can feed itself is through fertilizers. You okay. have nitrogen fix, nitrogen, particularly nitrogen fixing fertilizers. You can juice, you basically steroids in the, in the fields, <laughs> juice the <laughs> really? fields, yeah. juice the fields. Okay. And then you can only do that for a while. And there's all these problems, but they're yep. going to spawn from that. But even right now to make those fertilizers, you need energy. If your yep. energy system fails, you can't produce those fertilizers. You can't, you can't pr- produce those crops. You can't feed your people. You get famine. Yeah, you have to have access to a variety of things, including various chemicals. I don't know what what the situation is there, uh, but yeah, fertilizer isn't just something that magically happens. No, and fertilizer is a a byproduct typically of natural gas production. So you know, so a lot, most of the fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, all that, they're all you know, they all come from petrochemical um, productions, particularly typically. So again, so the whole environmental transition, all these sorts of things. They impact all sorts of systems in, in different countries. And again, the problem with China in general is scale. It's just, it's like, <laughs> it's just this, every problem that you have, this, when you try to consider how to fix it, you're like, oh my God, like, it's not like we have 20 more people this year. It's like we have 200, you know, it, it's, it's insane. <laughs> um, and so what you typically yeah. see is the Chinese state will do horrific, brutal things that almost no other state would contemplate in order to fix these problems. The one child policy is a great example. Like right. people don't quite realize, but the, the one child policy was imposed on a country that was primarily rural and had no contraception. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means forced abortions across the country. That means, me, you know, compulsory menstrual monitoring. That means people spying on each other. That means, you know, people tied down to ban- women tied down to like bamboo um, carts and screaming, you know, get, being thrown into hospitals to do abortions. This means nurses whose careers were like doing 25,000 abortions. Like we're talking stuff that is, is very, is very heinous. I mean, it doesn't, nothing yeah. to do with mod, like our pro-life, pro-choice. We're talking like 300 million people were pro- around there probably aborted or like yeah. prevented yeah. from being born. Right. So, and just, yeah, it, it's a, it's a crazy thing. <laughs> and well, that like also you, caused all these current problems, which is. Yeah. yeah. Like you say, like when you're facing that kind of massive famine on that scale, and I mean, it's possible, I suppose, that there were other ways to do things, but I don't know. I What do you do when you're in that situation trying to come up with solutions to s- at least keep your current population surviving? That's the question. So what I try and do often is I try and get people into the actual mind of, forget the Chinese Communist Party, anyone who's trying to rule China. And I right. mean the, the mentality of any single person who's managed to rise to the top, conquer China, and try the, the act of trying to keep it together – that is a terrible job. <laughs> that is a very, very <laughs> bad job. And all your options suck. And they all offer terrible trade-offs. And yeah. but, but actually, it's actually getting into that perspective of actually forget like the party and this and that. Like one thing I've said a lot is, um, you know, if let's say that the Chinese Communist Party had lost, right? right. They lost the Civil War, right? Ever, yeah, the nationalists in power. For China to look like it does today, all modern and developed, the only way that would have happened is if the nationalists had become eerily similar 
to the current Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> that is the only way. It's like like China. China is not an authoritarian megastate because it's communist. Like it it is authoritarian megastate because it's China. That's what it has always been. It has to be. It, if you want to be an integrated, unified, powerful China, that is what you have to be. Period. There, there's no. There's no. Like that's why all these guys are saying, oh, like democ- you know, economic development will lead to democracy. It's like no. That is that was never going to happen. But again, we you know we have. It's the same thing we're talking about, like the democracy and republic and what does this all mean and what do the people think? Right. We just had a totally different perspective. It's and it's it's just wrong. I mean, it's it just straight up was wrong. And now, like, for example, there's no one who thinks that China is becoming a democracy anytime soon. But like, if you go back to 2005, <laughs> people were kind of thinking that. OK, so what happened? Like, so, you know, now that we're somewhat more aligned with how reality probably is on this in this uh, thing. But we're still stuck with, like, how do you understand this country? And like, what do you actually do about it? Because it is a terrifying place and it's going to get a lot bloodier most likely right because again like we're saying like things start going down and let's say you start you don't have the world the best economic uh, record in history anymore you know that, that starts to fade well it looks like you're probably the gravy train was probably helping you know paper over a lot of problems right uh it just, right. and so then you know to deal with the problems once they're there well you need a typically iron and bloody fist that's typically the way that works So I'm curious because a lot of uh, discourse like that, people will cite statistics like uh, uh, China has a rising uh, middle class, more home ownership than you have, say, in the United States, uh, stuff like that. All these positive statistics to try and, you know, paint a particular picture. So I'm wondering, like, how much we can actually rely on some of those statistics to paint that picture. Yeah. So we always got to remember that. Typically, most things people have been saying about China, there's like weird political things, but a lot of it has just been financial marketing, right? It's people marketing schemes in China, their products, they're they're trying to justify their uh, labor they use over there, the tax policy, all these different things. Um, it has been to, to you know allow them to continue to build or market products from there. And the, the real challenge is, and the current one is has been, oh, there's a big middle class in China. And this is... The, the attempt here is to market the fact that there's going to be a large con- excuse me, consumer market you can take advantage of, you know, a large mm-hmm. Chinese consumer market like you have in the United States. You're like, oh, there's going to be a billion Chinese consumers. That's been the new, that's like post 2010. <laughs> like That's the new thing we're trying to spin. Okay, well, that is never, almost certainly never going to happen. There's a lot of reasons I could go into, but you mentioned um, home ownership and, and, and that wealth. But people, what anyone who's looked at any of history realizes that the Chinese property bubble, property market, let's say... It is the probably the largest asset bubble in human history ever. Okay. Because and so anyone, so you go to China, you go into it, you know, you'll you fly in, you'll go into you know a train station, and you'll just take a train anywhere. You'll often see like giant apartment towers like lining the railroad as you're going places. Like it's not even in a city. There's just tower after tower after tower after tower, right. and and they're all and the, so you have giant apartment fort like apartment tower forests with all these thousands of identical units and. It's crazy. I mean, so what's going on in China is that there are no real investment options in the country. So over 80% of Chinese savings are held in cash, in um, basically cash, yeah, cash deposits and homes because the stock market, the casino, the the bonds, none of that works. None of those are good investment options. So almost everything has been funneled into the property market. Like it is way, it is way more, like there is, Something like, I don't know, what, 67, 70% of Chinese urban wealth is all in homes. This is over double okay. the rate in the United States. And there's been no real price correction in this country. So you just had building, 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 building. You have this really sick, twisted uh, situation where the local governments want as much uh, building as possible. Developers want as much building as possible. The central government wants as much um, in, in uh, real estate development as possible to juice the, the GDP numbers. The people want as much, uh, and the people want the home prices to rise because that's their net worth. So basically, what we have in China, like if you want to talk about middle class wealth in China, it is so tight. It is all in real estate. Mm. That's basically what's going on. It's all in real estate. So when this bubble crashes, which it is going to do, because like I was saying earlier, the Chinese party, the Communist Party lied about the, the overall s- size of the Chinese population as a baseline. Okay. So let's say yeah. you said you had 100 million. So the, like, let's say you had 40, the US government said, oh, we have 40 million more people in the United States than we thought we did. And suddenly you start <laughs> building all this stuff because you're assuming you have way more people than you do. Right. And you're like, oh God, we have all this ex- these excess units. Like the, the volume of, of buildings in China compared to, and the price right now, it's totally out of whack. 
And also just for people to know, like these aren't McMansions. You know, in the United States, we have like these giant McMansions in the middle of nowhere. These are like four, 500 square foot, tiny apartment units that often don't come with basic furnishings. They don't have faucets. They, like it's, <laughs> I mean, this is, these are not quality. These are meant to, what they are is they're meant for throughput. These developers build them as quick, as many, as quickly as possible, and then totally forget about them and have no interest in, they're not meant to survive multiple business okay. cycles. They're just, let's go, let's move on to the next one. Like throwaway housing. Yeah, it's throwaway housing. Uh, not all of it, but like a lot of it. Okay. And yeah, so 25% of urban Chinese homes are vacant. You know, they're actually, the Chinese people, they're, this isn't a real property market. Also, this is a speculative market because something like 80% of home purchases are for second or third homes. Because it's, like I said, it's an asset. It's not being used to house people. It's being used ah. to park your money into it to hope you, so you can bet on the home price rising. So that means you have a quarter of the units aren't being used as homes. And so anyway, this whole thing, <laughs> like we're starting to see this, the Evergrande was the most dead company on earth you know, recently. And there's this whole crisis going on with the property market in China. The government's try, is finally trying to just, just tame it because it, also properties all told, it's probably around one third of Chinese GDP. It has its roots and fingers in everything. Like we hear, oh, it's all high tech in China. It's like super high tech. Super, no, it's like, no, one third of the country is still pure land speculation and real estate development. And it makes sense. You had to build 600 cities, you know, major cities in the last decade. Like there's a lot that was there. But anyway, <laughs> it went way past, way, 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 way past what was economically or demographically viable <laughs> a long time okay. ago. And the, the problem is they they don't want to stop the gravy train. So they've, they're they letting it get worse and worse and worse and worse. And they're finally trying to start doing it, but it's bad. I, I, I bring all this up because this is the Chinese urban consumer, they like they are parking all of their wealth into homes, and mm -hmm. and that's also supposed to be their savings. And so once this thing collapses, it's just like, yeah, it's like any bubble, right? Once you yeah. you pump it up with investment, and then it pops, and everybody loses their money. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be the Chinese consumer. Like that's the people you're betting on. Their savings are all gone, uh, or or their net worth is just going to be decimated. So I mean, yeah. that's just one take on why you can't have a Chinese uh, major con Chinese consumer base. Uh, you know, there's many more. I mean, there's there's a lot more you could go into, but that's just sure. the most uh, useful one for people who hear this in the next couple of weeks. Maybe like this is a major story for the next couple of months is going to be this, what's going on in the Chinese property market? Because it's been spooking the world because right. if this thing collapses, it's like, it, it was scary. You know, it's a very scary thing. Like, let's just say, you know, we remember the financial crisis that started for US, you know, in US subprime real estate. Yeah. And <laughs> Chinese real estate makes the US subprime look like, a joke like they're investing like double a year what the u.s was investing before uh wow. the financial crisis into real estate they've been doing it for years so uh yeah that's that's a long-winded <laughs> discussion of like not just one in particular where like it's getting to the point now where all of these uh like you said like we don't know what to trust it's getting to the point where anyone who's actually looked at this stuff like we all know where things are going, but a lot of these old narratives are still running. Like they're running like right. on auto, like zombie narratives. They're just like kind of still rolling. And, you know, a, a lot of people, you just, you, you can't get, you have to have someone who can like break through and say, you know, this is total nonsense. This is crazy. Um, or it isn't. And the big problem with China is that it was able to, like a lot of people have been predicting China would collapse for like decades. Right. right. And, and it hasn't happened. So far, uh, and so, so far, they've avoided that. <laughs> yeah, so far they've avoided that. But the you know the the truth is is like they're not going to be these people were probably wrong on timing, but right on the substance. And a lot of it was mm -hmm. like you really did have so much economic activity in China, uh, whether that's real economic activity or bubble stuff or debt field stuff. You know that's all debatable. But right at this point, it's not really debatable. But it, you know <laughs> back then it was. Um, but it's just this you know this this ramp is you know the the, the runway is is you know it's. It's disappearing. That's basically what yeah. I mean, in a sense, it's like any uh, economic system that is built on like without unlimited growth, right? Like when they you have unlimited growth as your <laughs> goal, I guess at the end, like it's going to run out of room. Yeah, and so the world economy is really about to change pr profoundly really soon. So one way to think about the world economy is that since around the 1920s, we've had a um, industrial consumer economy, basically. So you go back to old Marxist theory in the, in the 19th century, and all the workers were in satanic mills, basically, and it was miserable, and there was coal mines, it was terrible, and it was, it was actually really awful. I mean, it was yeah, no, miserable sure. <laughs> and miserating, right? But then, you know, a really profound change happened in the 1920s, where the structure of capitalism basically 
twisted itself. And instead of um, sort of just exploiting workers and, you know, then Marx would say, oh, you know, all they're, they're all going to get together and the, it'll be, the exploitation will be so bad that they'll all rise up and destroy the capitalists. Well, and then the, the system changed in the 20s and decided to say, hey, how about we start designing and developing any sort of conceivable product to suit any conceivable need that you may have? That's kind of the world that we have. Where you have <laughs> let's have soaps. Let's have toilet paper. Let's have, you know, all this. It's crazy. The number of things that just spawned out of this. Yeah. And, you know, there's good, there's good and bad. But this whole world, this whole consumer industrial world is, you know, it's predicated, like you said, on ever rising growth. And it, typically it's been population increases. So right. regardless of what happens, at least the population is growing. So it's like, you know, you can at least grow as much as, you know, your market can grow as much as basically roughly the population growth. That's yeah. been you know, like you look at the actual numbers, it's like basically half of economic growth in the U.S. since 1970s has been through population growth. The other half is like productivity and innovation. Uh, you knock out the population growth, which is what's happening all across the world, including right. China, including Europe. This entire consumer industrial system has to evolve. And it's yeah. not going to, you know, what's most likely going to happen, it's not going to be like, oh, this could be a mass revolution because these systems are now too complex to actually unravel or unwind. It's going to be a very tortured, painful evolution into some new structure. And a lot of the right. world is going to be left out. Yeah. If you look at the last history, that's the way it's, it's consistently happened. And it's, I mean, it's, it's very dubious, but in this world, in that sort of world, the Chinese system is, is so misaligned for what's going on, right? Because China produces one third, roughly, of global manufactured goods, but it can't consume like the 10th, you know, maybe consume 10% of it. <laughs> and that's going to go down. So they have right. this massive industrial plant that with that, with a, a declining global consumer base, like this whole thing is totally misaligned. It's very dangerous. It's very scary because no yeah. it means mass unemployment, like tens of millions of people get right. losing, losing their jobs. So I, uh, it makes me curious because uh, r right now, a lot of what we're hearing is how big a threat China is to the West. So uh, how does this uh, picture that you've kind of painted for me of China's inevitable collapse, uh, <laughs> how does that fit into the they're a threat to us. Yeah, I, so that's what you mean by us, right? Like if you're Taiwan, China's a threat, <laughs> okay? Right, right. You know, yeah. If you're Japan, Ty, Ty, uh, China's a threat. You know, th these are, you know, the thing we got to remember is that the United States, we're always comparing everything to the United States. Yeah. China is not the United States. You know, the United States has Canada and Mexico as neighbors. And the, the U.S. military is not designed to do anything, not even to, to look at China, I mean, to Canada or Mexico. It's designed to do right. very other, other things all around the world. China is very different. It has Russia and India and, you know, Japan and South Korea and North Korea and, and Vietnam and all these like ancient, large, <laughs> historic enemies and industrial nations all around it. It's a very yeah. different world. And it has a lot of vulnerabilities. It has far more vulnerabilities than it has uh, strengths. You know, we go down the list of all these things. But the, the key thing is that, you know, China's actually dependent. We're so used to thinking of China as a major uh, exporter. China exports everything around the world and it has everything we all need to get stuff from China. But that's not true. Starting a couple of years ago, China actually started to become one of the major importers of basically everything, which makes okay. sense because it has, it built 600 major cities, you know, in the last, over hundred cities with over a million people in the last couple, you know, few decades. It has to yeah. fund, it has to sustain all this stuff. It needs, you know, it needs iron, it needs copper, it needs both sides. It needs every single mineral you could possibly imagine in massive scale. And doesn't have all that within its own country. And mm -hmm. that includes, you know, obviously fertilizers, that includes different energy resources, all this stuff. So the problem China has is it needs to, ideally it wants to be, so what it's trying to do right now is become independent in all these key systems. So that includes semiconductors, that includes energy uh, flows, it includes all this stuff. But it's, they're massive. They're like China consumes more energy than, 50% more energy than the United States to build all that energy and have it all be nuclear power or whatever, something that you could have within your own country, that's decades and trillions of dollars. They don't have mm -hmm. that kind of time. So China's kind of blown its load is one way to think about it. The society that it's built, the structures and systems it's built are what it has. And to re, so agriculture is a great example. To, to redo the Chinese agriculture system, agriculture system, trillions of dollars. To redo the Chinese transportation system, trillions of dollars. Like I'm not making this up. It's like you go across the board just because of its scale and it's right. massive. Yeah. And funding that's gone. I mean, you could fund that when you had the early catch-up growth. You were building all the basic systems that Germany and Japan and Canada and the United States all had. And you, you were in, in a globalized world. We had access to key minerals, resources, technologies, uh, people, labor, everything cheaply and freely. Yeah. Now that whole world is kind of changing. There's protectionism. There's, you know, there's all this stuff is coming back. 
And yeah, you're kind of left in the lurch. But to your, your question just about how big a threat <laughs> is to the United States, you know, this is the key question here is really, um, first of all, the, the Chinese military is designed to conquer Taiwan. That's the first mm-hmm. thing. So if it's going to do something, it's going to try to conquer Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. What, what does it even mean to attack the United States? Like, like let's object. Let's try and think about it. Right. Cause again, this is, you have to go on the ground. You have to go on the ground. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, right. You, you just start randomly lobbing missiles across the Pacific ocean. Like, what is that going to accomplish? <laughs> like, it doesn't seem like, terribly like, productive. It doesn't, it doesn't seem terribly productive. No, I mean, the thing, you know, China has a whole, uh, the, the communist party has a whole narrative about re- reunifying China, restoring its greatness and doing all this kind of stuff. And Taiwan is a key part of that whole vision. Mm-hmm. It has a plan. It wants to have Taiwan, I believe by 20, 20- 35 and at long at the latest 2049 when the the centennial of the communist revolution happens oh, okay but the, yeah and so you know, china's methodically trying to build up its military to do this and there's all, what people are often saying is like hey if it managed to conquer taiwan that would mean you know the u.s gets booted out of the western pacific and the whole world might be changing and even symbolically that would make chinese the chinese landmass objectively larger than the united states landmass it'd be like you know that's like kind of a symbolic right. thing like, oh wow we're not bigger than you but this is just you know, I, I feel like, well, you got a lot of things also happening. Like, so the, the Taiwan is always saying, oh my God, we need more money. We need more missiles. China is going to destroy us. You know, you know we're going to get whacked. Like we need, you know, so they're always trying to say, we need more help. We need more recognition. And then China is always trying to pretend like it is so powerful and it could just stomp Taiwan easily. And that we should all accept it as a fait accompli, right? We're so big. They're so weak. Just accept it. We're going to take over them at some point anyway. What can you do about it? But the, the actual truth of trying to conquer Taiwan, because this is not new. You know, Chinese right. governments have fled to Taiwan previously in history. You know, when the Ming and Qing dynasties went to this massive civil war, the old Ming dynasty fled to Taiwan and had to be conquered. Like, this is an old pattern here. This is not new. Um, and Taiwan is a miserable, miserable place to try and conquer. For people who don't know, the the eastern side of Taiwan is just a bunch of mountains. Uh, that's, <laughs> you can't do anything there. The, yeah. the center of it's mountainous. And then you have a bunch of mud flats all along the western coast. And there's a very few uh, uh, quality landing sites anywhere in Western Taiwan, the, the coastline of Western Taiwan. So yeah, it means concentrating all Chinese forces into a couple areas. And then basically what China would have to do is launch just insane numbers of ships and helicopters primarily to, to, to land troops. And you have to land hundreds of thousands of troops. You know what I mean? Like right. this is, amphibious invasions are some of the most complicated uh, military operations to conduct, right? The U.S. did them in you know, Normandy is iconic for a reason. Like that's, that easily could have just been a disaster. In yeah. Chon, in Korea, during the Korean War, also could have been a massive disaster. And actually, you know, no country's ever done intercon- you know, inter-hemispheric amphibious <laughs> landings like the United States has done. But the even just doing it across the Taiwan Strait, you know, Germany didn't want to go in, in World War II. It didn't want to, it didn't bother to go try and cross the, the English Channel to, to conquer, to, to land in Britain for the same reason, because it can right. really be a disaster. And trying to do that, to a modern advanced industrial economy with 20 million plus people, you know, this is, this is a, da- a dubious proposition. You know, people, you could talk about how, you know, electro- electronic warfare, cyber warfare, all these things could just wipe Taiwan out right away. But the, the actual net effect of all this is to totally destabilize the global economy. And that mm-hmm. means also China has to make sure this happens while securing all the continued resource flows that it needs to run its country. So one reason that China is not doing this. And I don't think it's going to do it the next couple of years unless it's trying to surge a nationalist frenzy in the country to, to help avoid problems. Like it's a, it could be a real unifying nationalist issue to try and like do Taiwan. But if you fail, probably means the total collapse of Chinese Communist Party legitimacy and rebellions right. probably in the country. Like, so they're, if they do it well, that could be good. You know, and well, it could be good internally. It could be disaster <laughs> for the rest of the relationship with the rest of the world. If right. they mess it up, it almost certainly means the end of the Communist Party. Because they failed at this thing they've talked about for a million years. And they're just, they, they run on competence because there's no ideological foundation for the Communist Party in China. I mean, I actually have a, a, a podcast episode coming out about this for anyone more on, more on the leftist side. I want to know the, the many convolute, convolute history of how, what China's yeah. Communist Party ideology has devel- devolved really into. It's basically an empty void <laughs> where you use the, the assertions of power and will say whatever you want to, to get what you need done. Like, the combination of like, you know, you know, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, Deng Xiaopingist, Xi Jinpingist thought this whole this, this whole thing. There's no this doesn't cohere together into anything for anyone who wants to know. It's been just like little convoluted, pragmatic evolutions to whatever need to get done. Right, right. But now basically what the Communist Party runs on is results, outcomes. 
We have improved your life. We've grown uh, GDP a thousand percent since two since two thousand, and that's right. been a great great thing to run on. The only question is what happens when it's gone. Right. So that is when you start to get, hey, maybe we need wars. You know, maybe we need stuff like that. But the real the real thing also is that United States, Japan, and Taiwan are basically integrating the, you know their defense systems, and it means th- basically to defeat to defeat a Chinese invasion of Taiwan means give the Chi- the Taiwanese mines and give them missiles. If you mine the Taiwan Strait, you put enough mines there, there's ne- they're never going to be able to land enough ships. Like this yeah. is again, this is awful warfare, right? Real warfare. I'm talking about like this yeah. isn't like oh like you mine one of the most it, that also destroys Chinese commerce all right, right? And it, it, seriously, like a real war between Taiwan and Taiwan. You're looking at like Chi- Taiwan probably destroying a lot of uh, electrical facilities in China. You're looking at blackouts in China. You're looking at all sorts of problems. And this. This is bad. The southern Chinese coast is one of the most restive, rebellious areas in China. It's not connected into the rest of China. There's different ethnicities, different cultures, different languages, different histories. Right. This is, you know, this is also why you see China clamping down on Hong Kong for the same reason. You don't want all these basically isolated cities along the, the southern Chinese coast to start thinking their own thoughts. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, right. so it, it's a dubious thing. But yeah, missiles and mines. You know, the, if the, the U.S. gives Taiwan enough missiles and mines. Uh, it it makes just trying to conquer that island something pretty, or China could lose one third of its military capability just trying to do this. Yeah, it's uh. So yeah, to your point, yeah. to your point, yeah. I'm I think a lot of the current uh, rhetoric about China being this great threat, uh, most of it is overblown, and a lot of it is because the United States avoid like I was saying twenty years ago. Like I was very into this for this very reason. I thought, oh my god, this big country is coming around. Like I've I've been through every single position on what China is going to be before I came to this one. I thought right. it was going to take over the world. I thought it was going to be this. I thought it was going to be great wars. And so I, I'm very familiar and I understand those positions. But the thing is, the United States was just distracted and misaligned and misdirected for so long that now it's freaking out, which is always what happens. Whenever a country gets to around two thirds of US GDP or more, J- Soviet Union, Japan in the 80s, like the US just yeah. freaks out. And we're doing that now. And also, you got to remember, the United States is so chaotic and partisan there's so many chaotic partisan divisions right now that China is something that can unify people. And so particularly anyone involved in the military, anyone involved, I mean, they're trying to use China to get the US to perform at its highest level, which, right. hey, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world, but most of it is being used as a deliberate way to mot- motivational tactic. I don't think you're going to see massive <laughs> wars between China, like, you know, naval battles in the, in the Western Pacific. Right. Like US, you say, it's, China. it's very much the cold where cold war mentality where it's like, okay, well we have this enemy. So now we have to be a unified United States. <laughs> yeah. And I have a podcast episode where I say like the, the real answer to this is to find out what you are as a nation and try and, you know, execute on some plan and do you have your own internal vision for what you need to be, what you're trying to be. You can't use forever. You can't always use foreign proxies to try and motivate yourself and get you to perform at a higher level. You actually have to have some sort of internal vision, which we don't, <laughs> which is terrible. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So I think you'll see, you're going to see a lot of this, like, especially the next five years, depending on what happens in China, it's just going to be cons- constant. Uh, just compare, everything's going to be compared to China. You know, every single issue, like, you know, I've, I've you know, done interviews about China and Bitcoin, China in the military, China in religion, China in the Western values, China in this, China in anarchism, <laughs> China in libertarianism, China in communism. Like it's, it's China X everything because it's now the main case and people right. are scared. You know, it's crazy how I can talk to super liberal, um, you know, activists, anarchists, you know, far as far left as possible or people far right. Like, you know, people in Alabama who, you know, don't believe in any of you know, and they'll all, they all basically say the same thing that China is like the scariest thing ever. Uh, <laughs> so it's, there's a, there is a unifying element to this. So it makes sense that people in positions of power are trying to push this. Um, yeah, they people should be that. aware it's happening. That's what but, all I'm trying to say. Be aware that's happening. Yeah. Um, that, cause that's definitely what's going on. Uh, but yeah. And, and so, you know, it depends what people want. I mean, the U S military is massively upgunning right now to prepare, prepare for this conflict. So there's all sorts of things going on, but what's probably going to happen is global events are going to start to spiral out of control independently of this China U S dynamic. So right. And you're already seeing it, like China power crises, energy crises in Europe, uh, just all of this stuff. Uh, that it it won't be the main story, most almost certainly. I guess we're we're almost at an hour, but uh, I want to ask you, like, uh, what does China's uh, do they have a plan for climate change? Ha! 
Um, <laughs> well, so early on, you know, early tw- around 2010, China thought climate change was a hoax perpetrated by the West to try and stifle China's rise. They thought it was all okay. crap. <laughs> Uh, then the environmental backlash in China got so big that they started to change their tune. And then they started, they saw that there was new markets to enter, like, you know, solar panels, stuff like that. They started to push output super high, push all of it. And now they want to be at the very cutting edge, you know, and they they also think they can leapfrog the West on certain technologies like electric cars. So that's all like pushing them to, to go as far as, and as far as possible on climate change. But the truth is that, like I said, it required them. Altering many Chinese systems requires trillions of dollars and a lot more time than they have. Right. Energy is one of those ones. Like they, they, you know, the power crisis in China is already showing that they're probably not going to be able to get rid of coal anytime this decade. They said, yeah. oh, we'll start by 2026. China uses more coal than the rest of the world combined. To people right, who don't yeah. know. So it's enormous. So anything you want to say about China being XYZ, if they use more coal than the entire world combined, uh, <laughs> this is just, this is a farce. And it is, it's, it's greenwashing, most of it. Um, mm. It's for domestic consumption. It's trying to convince people that they're in foreign countries that they're on the, the cutting edge and the vanguard of all these things. But actually doing it is going to be really tough. China, it, just structurally, the, the renewable energy sources are mostly the really good ones, good wind sources, good solar energy, good solar radiance. That's all in Western China, far away from major population centers. So you need massive transmission lines. You have to redo the whole electrical <laughs> grid. Uh <laughs> Yeah, that's it, not going to work, eh? Well, you could do it. It's just, it's just again, it's time and money. And China, they're dedicated. They they go for things. But it, it, there's a lot. Uh, there's just a lot of trouble with it. I mean, the, the best option, in my opinion, for the Communist Party is for China, I guess I should say. It, it, they need nuclear energy. They need, mm-hmm. they need to massively expand nuclear energy. And they know that. The challenge is that the nuclear power industry just has few economies of scale, every single building, like in, in England, there's like a single power plant that's trying to create nuclear power. It's cost like $15 billion. Yeah. You know, and China will need dozens and dozens of them. So you, you need to get economies of scale, but it's a highly regulated industry. And there's so much back. I mean, Fukushima, all these things, even the communist party is not going to start mass producing shitty nuclear power plants. You know what I mean? Like that's right. just a, a license. That's just, it's going to explode in your face and prevent any hope of Chinese energy independence if they let that happen. So right. they're very nervous about it. And but it's 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 coming. I mean, we're we're in for a real storm with the uh, the energy situation in the world because we basically pushed renewable energies before they were cheap and widely uh, available enough for for consumption, and we're going to need further investment in fossil fuels and even not even further investment. I mean, we're basically a lot of Europe is being pushed back to coal because mm. of all these high natural gas prices, and they've it's just it's a terrible situation. What's going on? But, you know, we need we're, what's probably going to happen. We're going to need an uh, all of the above strategy. That means it's not obviously the fossil fuel industry was preventing all these sorts of things for a long time. That's all true. But you're going to need oil, natural gas. You know, it's, it's still 80 percent of global energy. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's that. You're going to need that for a while. But you're also going to need to do the environment, the renewables at the same time. You have you need an all of the above strategy, uh, especially if you're China, because <laughs> you, you're you're. I mean, the reason they have this coal crunch, this power outage system, is just so much of this. It's just because they were, you know, trying to improve their image in, in front of this uh, birthday party they had in, J- in July yeah, and yeah. trying to improve and it just trying to move on, on this environmental agenda. And it just totally failed. Um, and it's it's going to be really <laughs> tough. It's going to be really tough. So, yeah. do they Are they going to be able to do the environmental? Stuff? Here's the real truth. Most countries that are saying they're going to be green aren't going to be green. That's also yeah, crap. No, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, thing. even Canada, like uh, we're, we're not even on track to get to our goals for 2025 or whatever they are. Like we're not even started really. Yeah, no, it's, it's all, it's all, you know, these are politicians who are setting dates, you know, aspirational dates for when they're not even going to be in office. So they, yeah. they have, there's no, it's all nonsense. And Canada's chances of doing it are basically zero. I hate to break it to you. Like there's no <laughs> yeah. sun, there's no sun, there's poor, there's poor renewables, uh, yeah. And you have a lot of internal divisions in your country, especially in Alberta with all the, the tar sand, all the conservative yep. politics there. It's uh, it's really a, a, a dicey situation. And I mean, to be fair to the Alberta workers, I, I mean, their entire livelihood has been built on working in the oil industry for their, you know, generations. So now they're like told that, hey, we have to move away from this and they have no idea what's going to happen. So it, it creates that insecurity that comes yeah. with changing industries. Yeah, and but the truth is the the Alberta oil industry it got knocked by American shale. That was the real yeah. thing. 
I mean, it has nothing to do with the green policy. The green policies are coming when it's already on the tail end of its lifespan. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's going to hurt too. That's going to be, it's going to transfer resentments most likely, but it's just dicey. I mean, it's the whole thing. The most likely option for Canada is to um, hook hook up into the U.S. energy infrastructure. <laughs> that, yeah. That's the most likely. It's going to be dependent on just what the U.S. does, as in many other areas of Canadian life. I mean, that's just the way that the cookie crumbled in North America for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's that's the thing we got to remember. Like, it's not just the rhetoric about China that's dubious. It's all of this stuff. Like yeah. all these, all these, for example, all these car companies that think they're all going to be doing electric cars. It's like, okay, maybe, <laughs> but maybe you don't even have the capital to invest. Like the, the the car business is a low margin business. The reason yeah. Tesla had to sell really expensive cars early on is to develop get the capital to even do this sort of investment. And the right. real car companies haven't invested in technology development in decades. So they've only done the only thing. So everything's outsourced in the, in the auto industry. The only thing that was really the core competency of a, of a manufacturer was its engine, which is now being ditched. Yep. So yep. it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a scary farce there. And then all the governments, oh, 2030, 2040. Here's, here's the real farce. Like they're getting rid of nuclear energy in Europe because they, they got scared by Fukushima. Okay. That, and then all these countries say, we're going to be nuclear free and this free and that free. Meanwhile, in the last nine years, Europe, there's been increasing aggregate coal burns in Europe behind the scenes because they're saying, oh, we're going to be green. We're going to be this. We're going to be that. No, you're not. You're in Northern latitudes. There's not a lot of sun. There's like intermittent <laughs> wind. It's like, okay, there's just behind the scenes. You're just reverting back to coal. It's a farce. Like no one's talking about this yeah. because it's just, again, we need, we need to be, instead of talking as much about left, right, we need to just be thinking more in terms of trade-offs. What are we, what am I being told? What am I not being told? Like what is going to happen? What are they trying to do? You know, what are the actual bad things that are going to happen with that? What are they like yeah. that? Because if we don't start doing this, um, we're just going to be like la di da listening to the narratives, la da, and then you get slapped brutally you know, a couple of <laughs> years later. That's what's going to just yeah. keep happening. Oh, China is going to take over the world. Slap. You know, like, oh, you know, the, the, Germany is going to be like this green revolution. It's going to have all this, you know, solar energy. It's like slap. No, it's going to go back to lignite. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a farce. So to, to end it with that, it's just this, all this media stuff, we need to really improve the, the consumption. I mean, what I encourage people to do often is to, you know, there are these websites that will tell you what's the political bias spread of all these different uh, organizations, these, all, these political media organizations. Just look at them and go try and get a read of each side, what they're saying, what they're not saying, what they're, what is, uh, you know, very uh, galvanizing to the left, what is very galvanizing to the right. Um, because w- what's going on is that particularly in Western countries in the United States, the political coalitions that compose the various parties on left and right are reconfiguring and recombining and evolving right now. So <laughs> trying to align yourself with some cohesive party platform on either side is going to be a fool's errand for a long time. It's going to be, you know, so there's so many people I know who've been, they were like strongly to the left and they felt like abandoned by their party and their people. And then they're like, now they're out in the wilderness. There's so many people where they were in the right, you know, before Trump, they're like abandoned out into the wilderness now. And, you know, it's, and, and they're just suffering. And, you know, so there's, we need, to calm, we need to calm down all that stuff because it's going to lead to just total existential, internal, uh, emotional, and psychological chaos more than it will like an, an integrated, an integrated <laughs> I party think we're platform. already there. Yeah, I think yeah already. exactly. So, but again, y- yeah. you know, if you want to, the, the, the thought and the, the thinking that we need to be doing is, 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 is ground up. It is how, how is this actual world that we have built functionally? What are the systems? What are, what, what are the things we need? What's the agriculture, yeah. the communication? the, you know, the, the state, this, this is what gives you, you know, while everyone else is going crazy, you can actually be building the knowledge about what is actually, how things are actually functioning and how they're most likely going to have to reconfigure when certain things start to break apart. I mean, that's, that's where things are going to happen. We spend too much time talking about like this hypothetical, ideal, political, abstract thing. It's like, that ain't the world. That ain't the real world. And, and that is the trouble is like, we're, we're looking at collapse in a lot of ways on the near horizon. Like, so we actually do have to just like start working on something sustainable that we can do ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that's the thing, you know, finding, finding the little circle of competence we have and kind of pushing out, expanding it. Um, you know, finding people who are also trying to do the same thing. It's, it's very valuable. It's going to be feel increasingly rare. Like I'm just amazed. Uh, really good friend of mine is from Western Montana. He's a sort of very liberal guy from a, most a conservative area. And I just read a big Washington Post article about how his hometown is basically just, you know, turning into just violent, you know, internecine political conflict about everything now. Yeah. It's just kind of infected everything. And it's just, it's really sad. Uh, it's, it's really sad. I mean, definitely, you know, says investing in your friends and family and people who could give you sort of a small uh, family unit. I mean, it'll be probably pretty valuable in an era of continual, 
you know, cultural, cultural and political <laughs> disintegration. Uh, yeah. Not to, not to sound brutal or, uh, you know, I'm actually very optimistic in the end, particularly if you're in, sitting here in North America, uh, very optimistic about, you know, things. But the next couple of years, it's just, you know, it, it's not going to be easy for sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah, I have, I have actually a significant amount of uh, faith in the people that when things hit, when shit hits the fan, people will band together and, and maybe help each other out, but. I kind of also thought that when the pandemic hit, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, we also all thought that the world would band together, and it showed us that all these nations aren't as cooperative and friendly and nice as we all thought. So yeah, hopefully that's, that's right. just the, the countries. It's not you know the people on the ground as much. Yeah, that's right. We're definitely going to see. Well, I guess uh, we're almost at an hour here, so thank you very much for your time. Where can people find more from you? Sure. You guys can check out my website. So it's just jasoncheftel.com. You can see articles, other things there. Uh, you should check out the podcast, the China Unraveled podcast. Um, it's really cool. I have a new episode coming out probably when you guys see this. Uh, that'll be cool. It's, a, it's the longest episode. It's about an, it'll be a, over an hour long probably. It should be really cool. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel. You can see me. I do little live streams about just big topics going on. They're quick. They're sort of off the cuff, uh, easily digestible. You can just, you want to hear about power problems or political this or that or whatever. It's cool. You can see, check that out. And I have, oh, once sort of the book I've been doing is done, I'll do more like kind of produce videos, but brain will explode if I try and do that now. So that should be enough. Yeah. And also check, <laughs> check out, you know, you just see me on Twitter, Jason Sheftel, you know, at Jason Sheftel. That's a good place to find me. Fantastic. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. That's all folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at skeptical lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>